Hello, Global Gardeners. Great to see you here on another Monday where we can start our gardening week talking gardening. What could be a better way to start the week? I just absolutely love it. I want to give a shout out to DC in Calgary, Canada. And we have Carmel Hill 18 joining us for the first time in the UK. This truly is a global audience. We've got lots of states in the US already represented and of course Canada as well represented. Hello to our wonderful moderators today, Heidi and Jay, and to all of you as we move forward with some great gardening info over the next 90 minutes. I wanna go ahead and give a good thank you out to Lisa Megan, it's been a great dialogue between Megan and Lisa. So Megan was asking about some white oozing bubbles on her basil. And Lisa jumped in and I completely agree. It probably is spittle bugs. And a bunch of you were like, what's a spittle bug? Well, this is one of those insects that that is actually pretty amazing. It, it, it gives spit on the plants. That's why it's called a spittle bug. And all the, that bubbly spit is, is where it ends up laying eggs. And it's not a huge problem for plants, but especially on a plant like basil that you're planning on eating, it can be quite attractive. Easy to wash off, but it is one of those things to start our day to highlight just how many different insect pests there are. We all know about aphids and caterpillars. But there are some crazy insect pests out there that do some crazy things like spitting bubbles on our plants. So thanks, Lisa, for giving some good info about that and all the rest of you that were involved with that conversation. I think that was great. Uh, Taco Promotions also asked an interesting question uh, with the focus on survival gardening. But this holds true with any type of gardening, asking what are the best crops to grow for a low cooking environment, something you could eat every day. Now the key, usually for survival gardening, and this is the, the type of gardening where, where you're growing food to feed your family in a situation you might not have access to normal store-bought food. And the, the key issues in those kind of situations, not just survival gardening, but for all of us who are devoting space in our garden for food, starches starches are really the way to go you want to grow foods that give you a good nutrition value for the plant that you're growing so beans and potatoes and sweet potatoes are really close to the top of the list those kind of things that you can grow they store well so you can have a big crop store them for multiple days of eating so when you're trying to grow something and you're thinking in terms of something you can eat every day, don't necessarily think in terms of something that you're harvesting every day. Think about something that you can harvest, store, and then eat on a regular basis. Now, there are some plants like kale. Kale in many areas can be grown year round and it's packed with nutrients and vitamins. So kale is one of those plants that you could be growing virtually year-round and harvesting on a daily basis and eating but it's really those starchy vegetables and root crops so carrots and beets and parsnips and turnips they can all be eaten raw in fact i eat all of them raw shave them into little slices and or little cubes and put into a salad and they also store extremely well for a long period of time. So when you are thinking about the biggest bang for your buck when you're gonna put plants in the garden, I like to grow the root vegetables, or I should say the vegetables that, that you harvest from under the ground, like the sweet potatoes and the potatoes and all of those carrots and beets and everything else. Beans are great because you can grow a whole bunch of beans, dry them, there is some cooking involved later on, but they store well. So those are some of the factors I think to look for if you're trying to choose plants to feed your family over a long period of time, and that can be eaten every day. There are wonderful fruits and vegetables that, that are just delicious in the garden, but they often take up a lot of space, and then you get one short harvest, and then there's not much you can do after that. 
Tomatoes, if you preserve them, can be another one of those, particularly during the summer, you're eating tomatoes every day. I think a lot of us are eating tomatoes every day. I know I am. But once the weather changes, if you've got a cold winter, then then the tomatoes are done for. And that's where the root crops come in because you can keep growing most of those crops in cool weather. So hope that helps you out, Taco Promotions, and gives you some ideas of crops to move forward with. Mage Grey Wolf is saying, sweet potatoes, keep in a dry spot and down, wash it off, or don't wash it off, I think we were saying, until you're ready to use it. Um, and and that's, that's actually a good, good suggestion, good tip for potatoes, for carrots, for beets, for sweet potatoes, a lot of those kind of plants, even garlic for anything that's in the ground, they tend to store better if you don't wash them after harvesting. So pull them out of the ground, let them dry off, brush off some of the soil, put them into storage, and they'll last longer than if you wash them and then put into storage. So thanks, Mage Grey Wolf. That was a good suggestion. Mornings at the allotment. Good morning or afternoon in Germany. Guten Tag and evening to everyone. Nice to see you here as well. Truly a global audience. I just love you all. This is so awesome to get together. And so we've got uh, the UK and Canada and Germany and all the parts of the US. It's, it's awesome. It's awesome to have you here. Steven's asking a good question. If you don't have a root cellar or basement, how would you store those crops? And so ideally, the root crops should be stored uh, below 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That's about 10 degrees Celsius and slightly below that. So a, a cool location. But you're right. Most of us don't have a root cellar or a spot like that. But, but most of us do have a spot in our house or in a shed or in the backyard that could double as a cool location. So for instance, I, I have a basement with a closet and it's the coldest part, part of my house. And that's where I end up putting a lot of my seeds and garlic and things like that that I store. But if you don't, if you live on one level and you don't have a basement, do you have a crawl space under your house? Is there an area under your house, you might be able to, to set up as a storage for root crops. If not, then you can just put it in a closet in a back room farthest away from your furnace and it'll work. It's not ideal, but the idea is that, that you want to store all of these root crops and all these long-term items like the winter squashes, for instance, away from the sun, away from a heated area as much as possible. And it might not be ideal, but if you can stick your, your crops in a back closet that is 10 degrees cooler than your front room, then you'll get longer storage. Just that little bit of, of temperature difference can uh, make the storage last a lot longer. So a uh, little bit of exploring, it's not ideal. I haven't done it yet and it's not part of my plan, but but if you are in that situation where you're trying to grow a lot of crops for long-term storage, consider digging a root cellar. It's really not that hard. Dig down uh, a few feet, cover it up, insulate it for the winter, and you can actually get some, some sustained, relatively cool conditions underground, and you've created a root cellar. That's what people around the world have done for thousands of years. And that could be a good alternative if you're serious about saving the crops long time for a long time. So today, the focus is going to be primarily, however, on soil. You've heard me say before, if you watch any of my videos and these live streams, soil is key to a successful garden. And I think this time of year is an ideal time to be focused on your garden soil, either because you're in the autumn and your season is starting to wane or because you're in the spring and your season is starting to kick off. So that was one of the big activities I did this week was working in my beds, pulling plants, amending the soil and getting my beds ready to go for a couple of different reasons. I'm putting garlic in in about a month. And so I've already prepared my garlic bed. 
it's amended, it's ready to go. I'm watering it. There's no plants in there right now, but I'm watering it so all that soil life is vibrant and helping break down the organic material that I put into that bed. And it's just waiting for the garlic to come in in about a month. Some of the other beds I've been working on and putting cover crops in, I'm preparing those beds for next year, springtime. And so this is one of those things where you, I don't think it's ever too early to improve the soil in your garden beds. And it's one of those activities that should be done. So it's just a question of when you choose to do it. And I think now is a great time to do it which is why I wanted to bring this up as uh, the subject to talk about today. Lila Lindum is saying, how do we add soil over perennial plants that will return next spring? Uh, so good question. And, and so I wouldn't necessarily say to add soil over those perennials. I prefer to add compost and or mulch over my perennials. And so if, unless you're planting in a bed and you're, you're having a, a big loss of the volume in that bed because the organic matter is breaking down, you usually don't need to add more soil to perennial beds. The soil is already there. And so by adding organic matter to the top of the soil, you, you, you give food for all those soil organisms, particularly earthworms that are coming up to the top of the, the, the soil and burrowing back down. So a lot of that organic matter will find its way into the soil. Beetles are great for doing that as well. <clears throat> There's lots of those insects that, that we don't think of as beneficial for soil, but if they're burrowing into the soil at all, they're taking all of that organic matter that we've placed on the surface and they're bringing it into the soil. That's why I think it's, you know, ants, I love ants in my garden because they help bring some of that material from the surface down into the soil. So encourage all of that soil life and all that insect life. And so on a perennial bed, uh, what I'll typically do, because all my beds are mulched, is I'll pull aside the mulch and then I'll put an inch or two of compost and then I'll cover it back up with the mulch. And over the winter into the spring, that material will gradually break down and all those soil organisms will help work it into the soil. And that's really a good way to improve your perennial beds, to improve the soil in your perennial beds. If you just add soil, you're not necessarily improving the situation. You really want to improve the soil life because it's that soil life that makes the nutrients within the soil available for your plants. And so one of the things I want to talk about today was fertilizers and the impact of fertilizers on soil. Too often we think in terms of using a fertilizer for our plants and we stop there. So we think our plant is deficient in nitrogen, so we put a nitrogen fertilizer on our plant. We want our plants to do well, so we give it a tomato fertilizer to get good tomatoes. Well. That's, that's really a short-term attempt for giving ourselves a warm fuzzy that our plants are doing well. It's not helping the soil at all. When we add fertilizers to the soil, it really begins disrupting the soil life, the bacteria, the fungi, and all of those other burrowing insects. It can really disrupt the life within soil because those organisms are working with the plants and the plants are working with those organisms. And, and this is where it just gets fascinating because the plants are, are, are releasing starches and sugars through their roots, exudates are what they're called. And those starches and sugars are what's feeding the soil life. And so the soil life around the roots of the plants multiply, populate that area and those organisms begin also feeding on the organic matter in the soil. And as they create this, this entire life within the soil, they're breaking down all of that organic matter into sources of nutrients that the plants can use. And so it's a, it's a relationship between the plant and between the soil 
for all of this to be healthy. But when you throw anything artificial into that environment, particularly the, the chemical fertilizers, the, 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 the fertilizers that are often made from petrochemicals, it throws it all off. So a lot of that life doesn't survive or doesn't multiply. And so once those fertilizers have been used up by the plant, well, now the soil is lifeless, essentially. And you can actually, and, and, and you may have seen this, if you use fertilizers, you have to keep using fertilizers. That's what the farmers are doing. That's what they've discovered in the, the big agricultural businesses is they have to keep fertilizing because all that fertilizer destroys this relationship between the beneficial soil life and the plants. And so if you stop using fertilizer, well, there's no soil life to now make all those nutrients available for the plants. So for the plants to survive, you got to keep adding more fertilizer, which just destroys the soil even more. So I use very few fertilizers in my garden. I'll use some fertilizer in my containers because uh, there's there's particularly if you're adding new potting soil in the spring to your containers, there isn't an abundance of life in that soil yet. So I will use fertilizer in those situations. But in my raised beds, in my in-ground beds, I'm just using organic matter to get that soil life to build a happy environment for the plants. And my plants are doing great. I, I think they're, they're happy. Could they be green, greener and bigger and taller? Sure, if I gave them a dose of nitrogen, but that's not what I'm after. I'm after that soil life to be healthy and feed the plants and then just sustain itself to the point that I can sit back and I don't have to buy fertilizer and I don't have to apply fertilizer. I just let the entire environment take care of itself and it's worked great for me for years. So uh, Dream Z's is exactly right. It's all about Mother Earth doing what Mother Earth does and you can help out by just throwing in some of that organic matter and all the rest will be wonderful. Your plants will love you for it. And that also holds true to some degree uh, when using uh, herbicides and pesticides, anything that, that is designed to kill a particular pest can disrupt the soil organisms. And so you've heard me say this before, there, there are almost always ways to deal with pests usually by getting a system in balance. And, and so uh, I just, I really think of the soil as a living organism. Now, it's not a single organism. It's made up of billions of different organisms, thousands of different species in every single bed that you have. And so if, if you are targeting one particular type of insect or pest with a chemical, you can expect that that chemical will also affect the life within the soil. And so that's, that's the way I look at it. There are situations where herbicides may be necessary. There are situations when pesticides may be necessary. But for the most part, I think most of us in our home gardens can actually get by by trying to develop that balanced ecosphere with everything working together and it starts with the soil. So, okay, let's see what else we have. Carmel Hill 18 is saying, what's your opinion on the green manure way of replenishing the soil? Great, great, great way to do it. And so uh, I have a couple of videos on the channel. I just did one recently on cover crops. And so a green manure, if you're not familiar with it, the idea is that you're growing plants to add nutrients back to the soil. And so the idea being, for years and years and years, farmers will spread manure on their field and the horse manure or whatever type of manure they're using will replenish the nutrients in the soil. So this idea of using plants to do the same thing, well, that's where this term comes from. The plants are green. They accomplish the same purpose as spreading manure. So we call them green manure. And it's just a cover crop. It's just a, a selection of plants that you grow for different reasons, depending on what you're trying to do with your soil. And so, for instance, and, and I talk about the uh, 10 different 
reasons to use cover crops in the recent video. And so for instance, one of them is to grow root crops like a daikon radish that grows deep and helps break apart dense soil. Then you can take all of that organic matter, all that biomass from those daikon radishes and either add it to the compost or keep it in the soil, turn it into your soil. Clover, legumes, there are lots of plants that are packed with nutrients, particularly with a focus on nitrogen. This is where a plant like clover or legume or hairy vetch come in. And if you take those plants and turn them back into the soil, or even just cut them and leave them on top of the soil like you might a manure mulch, they'll break down and they'll benefit the soil. The key when you're dealing with legumes, those nitrogen fixing plants, is you have to cut them down before they flower and set seed. Those plants have those little nitrogen nodules and they're working, again, they're working with the bacteria in the soil. It's actually the bacteria in the soil that makes that nitrogen available into those little root nodules. And then the plant uses that nitrogen to grow, to grow flowers and set seed. If you allow that plant to grow through its entire life cycle, well, you're not getting an excess of nitrogen from that plant because the plant is using that nitrogen. But if you cut the plant off while it's still young, while that, new, while that nitrogen has already been stored, it now can become available for other plants that you'll put in that bed later on. So that's the basic concept behind green manure is growing these kind of plants that can really benefit the soil. And it's a great idea. That's one of the things I mentioned early on. That's one of what, the things I did this week was to uh, expand the, the, the seeding of my garden beds with cover crops uh, with that idea in mind, the, the green manure improvement of my soil. I'll let pretty much all of them grow through the, the, the autumn and into the spring. One bed, the plants are already two to three inches tall, which is great. A lot of the other beds are just starting to germinate. And then come springtime, I'll do a couple different things. I want to do a video about this, so look forward to it in the spring. But I'll show those different methods on these different beds in my own garden, where I cut some of it down and just let it stay on top of the soil, and then I plant in that bed. Or I turn over the soil so all that biomass gets incorporated deeper into the soil, and then I plant into the bed. So look for that to come, but that's exactly what I'm doing now because I think it's a, a great way to do it. Uh, and so Brain Boz is asking, what's your opinion about raw wool as manure? And so uh, I did a video about some of the things that you could put into a compost pile a while back and cotton and wool and things that we typically think of as fabrics, uh, I think are better composted because particularly wool, wool takes a long time to break down. And so as a, as a manure, it, it doesn't have the, the nutrients, the plant-based nutrients that most manures do. Uh, it is an organic material and it will break down, but it takes a longer time to break down. And so I tend to think putting something like wool into a compost pile is a better way to go if you've got a lot of wool. Uh, you could also use it as a mulch. And, and I've seen some of this, I forget who it was, I saw, I saw a video a while back from the UK that, that mentioned this subject, where you take something like wool, I think it would be best to mix it with crushed leaves and, and maybe some dried grass and straw and use that as a mulch. Because it takes so long to break down, it's going to be there for a long time. By itself, it'll probably blow away. But it also absorbs a pretty good amount of water. Uh, it not necessarily absorbs it, but, but because of the way you use it as a mulch, uh, the water would flow through it onto the soil surface and would help keep the soil moist as a mulch. So there might be a couple ideas. That's not anything that I've done, it's, uh, but I think those might be some viable uh, options for you if you take that approach. Adele says, good morning from Alberta. Should I hang my peppers and coriander leaves in the kitchen or better in the basement? My chores are already full. Uh, so 
wherever you've got space, I run into that problem sometimes too. Uh, for, for drying purposes, uh, I personally like to dry my things like peppers and, uh, and the coriander leaves, the cilantro near the kitchen because I've done this before. Those of you who have done this as well, go ahead and chime in where we put something like herbs or peppers, we string them up, we hang them in a basement closet, and then about six or seven months later, we happen to go down, we open up that closet, it's like, oh, I forgot I had all these peppers here. Happens to me all the time. If I do the things that I'm, or if I dry the, the, the things I'm planning to use in the kitchen, someplace away from the kitchen, too often I forget about it, or I'll think about it, it's like, oh, I need to go down and collect those plants, and then you get preoccupied with something else. So out of sight, out of mind, at least in my world, means that some of those things get forgotten. So I prefer to do it near the kitchen so that I can see it, I can take care of it, and then I can store it as appropriate. So, uh, but totally up to you, Adele. If you've got more space in the basement, a cooler environment can, can make for a nice drying environment. But for me, uh, I tend to forget things that I, I, I hang up to dry if I don't have them in my mind. Alex asking, what's your opinion on using compost tea? Is there a best method to, pair, to prepare? Great question. And, and so you've probably seen a lot about compost tea. So, so here's the idea behind a compost tea. And again, it's all focused on the soil. And you want to be improving the soil. And compost is a great way to improve the soil. So the idea is that you take some of your compost, you put it in a bucket, and there's a couple ways you can do it. So one of the, the best ways, the ones that you see recommended most often, is that you take a, a fabric like muslin, and you wrap your compost in this muslin to make a bag, and then you put that bag into a five-gallon bucket of water, and you let it steep just like you would be making a cup of tea. Then, to really encourage the bacterial growth, because there's a lot of bacteria that are in that compost, and if you just put it in a bucket, well, what's going to happen is you're going to drown a lot of that bacteria. And the only bacteria that's going to survive are going to be the anaerobic bacteria. The aerobic that can't, or the bacteria that can't live in an oxygen environment. And so if you make a tea like that, you're making an anaerobic bacteria tea. And then you pour it on your soil. Well, you're killing a lot of the soil life. You're killing the bacteria that was in that bucket because it can't live in an oxygen environment. Then you're pouring that anaerobic bacteria into your soil, which displaces and kills the normal soil bacteria, which are all aerobic. So I might, I might have said that wrong. It's the anaerobic bacteria from the bucket that you're pouring into the aerobic bacteria in your soil. The anaerobic bacteria take over briefly, kill the aerobic bacteria. Now your soil, which is usually about 25% oxygen, kills all the, the anaerobic bacteria. And so what ends up happening is you get a soil completely out of balance because you've killed the aerobic bacteria and you've killed the anaerobic bacteria and it takes a while for the, the soil to get back to a normal healthy state. So when you're making your tea to encourage the aerobic bacteria in your compost tea, you put a bubbler in, you put like in a, a fish tank so that you have air bubbles going through that bucket and those air bubbles are encouraging the aerobic bacteria within that compost tea. That's the idea. My approach is to do none of that because what you end up with when you make a compost tea is a diluted liquid of nutrients with some bacteria, but it's going to be out of balance between the aerobic and the anaerobic. And those diluted nutrients that were in the compost, 
really aren't adding a lot to your soil. So in my opinion, you're going to a lot of work to create a compost tea and really not getting much of the benefit of compost. I prefer to take the compost and mix it directly into the soil or use it as a mulch. So if you're using it as a mulch, just take your compost, spread it on top of your bed, and now every time you water and every time it rains, well, that liquid is flowing past that compost into your soil, and those nutrients in that liquid are essentially a compost tea, but it's all happening, happening naturally, and you're not creating an imbalance with anaerobic bacteria. You're allowing the aerobic bacteria within the soil to now take advantage of that liquid as it flows through the compost and those nutrients that become available for the plants by way of the bacteria. So that's how I approach compost teas. I'm not a big fan of them. Now, in an indoor setting for seedlings, Compost tea can have some benefit because it's it's a diluted nutrient liquid. So if you buy a little bag of, of compost tea that you're supposed to mix with water, or you can actually buy compost tea that's already been made, and you use that to water your seedlings, in essence, you're using a diluted fertilizer. Most cases, if you're if you're getting a purchased product like that, there, there's minimal bacterial influence when you're using a compost tea like that so as a diluted fertilizer for your seedlings sure it can it can work okay and i don't have a big issue with that but to go through all that effort to try to get something for your garden soil all the stuff i've read and the research that i've looked into says that it just it just gets totally thrown out of balance and so garden professors there's a really good site gardenprofessors.com they're based out of Washington. They have a great series of articles about all gardening subjects. And, and they basically, I, I believe like they do, or they believe like I do, but, but you're not going to get the benefits from compost tea that, that you see cited by a lot of people that are spending a lot of time making compost tea. So there you have it. Long answer to a short question, but I just use straight compost and let the rain and the water and the microorganisms work it into the soil and benefit the plants rather than kind of like the earlier talk about fertilizers trying to get a big quick boost on my plants by putting compost tea on it because once it gets into the soil sure there might be a quick boost of plant growth but you're disrupting the entire life cycle and and web soil web that's that's within the the ground and that's one of those things I try to avoid is disrupting the soil web. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up here. Adox Artist is asking advice for squash, vine borer, squash bug control. Last two years here in Mississippi have devastated my pumpkin vines and cucumbers. Devon dust, neem oil, insecticidal soap, uh, diatomaceous earth three times a week, could not keep up. And so the advice that, that I've given before, and it's the way I approach it, is identifying what the pest is. So if you know it's a vine borer, most vine borers will spend a portion of their life cycle in the soil. And so recognize exactly what the pest is so that you can identify what time of life it spends in the soil. So sometimes it will be in the soil and then the larva crawls up into the vine and bores in or sometimes the adult will lay eggs into the vine and then the larva will crawl out and go down into the soil so a couple different options depending on the specific pest but the key is disrupt their life cycle and so recognize that for a portion of time they're going to be in the soil and so if you can Another big reason why no dig gardening is great for some areas, but if you live in an area where you have a problem like this with these pests that are overwintering or spending part of their life cycle in the soil, then by practicing no dig gardening where you just keep putting compost on top of the soil, you're not eliminating that problem. You're just 
controlling some of the symptoms. The, the, the pests will always be in the soil. But if you turn over the soil, if you cultivate the soil and break apart that area where the larva will be growing, then you can eliminate a vine borer problem because they just can't survive in the soil anymore because every spring you're turning over your soil as you put in more compost and as you're amending and you'll break the life cycle of that pest. Another great way is, again, because they reside in the soil or near the plants, grow those plants in a completely different area for a couple years. So you're disrupting the life cycle. You're not going to kill all those those insects in that first year. But now those few that are remaining that emerge from the soil, well, now they don't have any squash plants to feed on. And the insects are very specialized. So a squash vine borer is not going to eat a pepper plant. And so it emerges looking for food and can't find it because you're growing your squash in a completely different area. And then the other aspect of learning exactly what the pest is, some of these pests actually will overwinter in the plant or underneath the leaves. And so you clean up your garden. So if you've got a problem with borers, then you cut off all your plants and you toss them. Don't put them in a compost pile because you could just be creating a nice environment for them to survive the winter. Toss those plants, disrupt the soil, plant in a different area, take some time, but you may end up seeing better results than by using a Devon dust or neem oil or any of those other things that you're trying. And along the way, attract some of those beneficial wasps than those beneficial insects that will eat the larva or eat the eggs of the, the insect as well. And so diversity in your garden. Grow grasses, grow flowers, grow herbs, grow everything you can think of. And chances are it will be attracting one of those beneficial predators that can also help take care of your problem. So. Okay, let's see, Maria's Moments USA. Hello, back to you from Ohio. Uh, it's nice to have you here today. Let's see, Heidi is saying, uh, I've grown squash in containers so that any squash larva does not get into my regular plant areas and I can just stamp out the soil. Another great option, uh, kind of the same lines as grow it in a different area. Yeah, if, if, you, if you know that you have garden beds that might be infected or you suspect you might have problems and you don't want to infect your garden beds growing in containers it can be a great option so thank you for that i always appreciate your input that's nice alex asking what's the best way to feed the soil in pots and seed trays and so uh the i i, I like to start off with a, a a healthy potting soil now if you've got worm castings worm castings can be a great addition to potting soil. It has nutrients, uh, it has a little bit of nitrogen, it's got lots of bacteria, and that can be a really good uh, start to a potting soil is to work in worm castings along with lots of other organic matter. So that's a good way to start. Start with a good soil, and then you may or may not need to do anything else with the soil. And so for instance, my potatoes, I'll be harvesting the potatoes here very soon and that's what i did with my grow bags that i i have for my potatoes this year all my containers this year i started with a really good soil a little bit of fertilizer in the beginning a balanced fertilizer and then i did nothing i let the plants grow and they've done fine and now i'll be harvesting here pretty soon if you're growing in a a big container uh, especially a perennial where you can't get in and really amend the soil. That gets back to what I was talking about earlier, where you top dress with a compost or worm castings and mulch. And particularly for a big pot that's been sitting around for a while, there should be ample bacteria in that, that soil to be there, ready to use all that organic matter that you're top dressing, that you're adding to the top. But another great option, and this is what I practice, I had a video about this last year where I was talking about amending my beds in fall. One of the things I do 
And you know, I think it ties in with a little bit with what Heidi was just talking about, but I'll grow in my pots and containers, and then I'll add that soil to my raised beds in the fall as an amendment to add organic matter. And then in the, the spring, I start with a new fresh soil in my pots and my seed trays. And so I'm often starting with new stuff in the spring and then just dumping the old stuff in my beds. Or as I showed with my, uh, my, my tower system, the, the green stock vertical garden that I have, I, in the beginning of the year, added new amended soil, potting soil, to that vertical garden system. Because the soil had settled over the winter, it needed to be revitalized, so I just added some more potting soil to the old potting soil, and everything did fine. So a couple different options there as to how to do it. As far as feeding, again, I'm not, I'm not, I'm typically not fertilizing or feeding the, the containers or my seed trays because I'm starting with a good soil mix to begin with. Um, but uh, compost tea could be used in a situation like that. Comfrey tea, where you make a tea from comfrey leaves. Again, they're loaded with nutrients. You, you're essentially using that as a diluted fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, and that, well then, sure, for the short term, you might wanna use one of these diluted fertilizer ideas. But for the most part, I like to use my comfrey leaves in my compost pile or as a mulch or as one of those things I work into the soil rather than take my comfrey leaves and make a tea and then use that diluted fertilizer on the plant. So a lot of it depends on your soil health. I have a bit older video where I show how to make comfrey tea at the school garden and I needed that because the soil wasn't that good in those beds and so I did need to use the comfrey tea as a fertilizer for my plants until we were able to amend those beds and get them to the point that they didn't need that boost anymore. And then for years, we used no fertilizer at all in the garden because the soil was good enough that it took care of itself and it took care of the plants, which is really everything that you want to, to move for. Like that's kind of the, um, the, the target is to move to a situation where you're not having to add a lot to keep the plants growing because the soil's taking care of everything. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up here. And let's see, M, M. Creed's is saying, I planted my first irises too deep and they've rooted. Can I gently pull them up on the leaves or remove soil around them to expose more rhizome? Uh, so what I would suggest, don't pull up on the leaves because you might damage the rhizome uh, if you tug too hard. Just get down with a spade or a shovel, stick it underneath the plant, and then just pry it up to a point that, that you think is appropriate. You can pull off some of the soil on top of the rhizome and stick it back underneath the rhizome. Don't worry too much about damaging the roots. Uh, it, it's, it, it might affect the growth of the plant next year a little bit, but if you can do this as a big clump where you're you're putting your shovel in, prying it up to an appropriate height, and then adding soil underneath the shovel so that that clump of rhizomes and roots is now resting higher, you might see some good results. And so if you're growing irises, that's a common mistake for people growing irises is that they bury the whole rhizome. The rhizome can rot if it gets too wet and it's in the soil. And so irises will do great if the top portion of that rhizome is actually exposed to the air. And, uh, and so and that sounds like the situation is that they're, they're too, uh, too low in the ground and you want to expose some of that rhizome. Just pry the whole thing up, brush off some of that soil that's on top, put it back underneath, and you may see that things like that will end up working out okay for you. Okay, let's see. Looks like a couple of you have had some buffering. Sorry to hear that. It's probably on my end if it's more than a couple of you. And uh, let's hope that nothing like that happens again. And there's Jay. Yeah, irises like to be right at the surface. There you go. Jay knows her stuff. Lift the whole clump up with a small trowel and brush soil at the surface. 
hey, I like it when Jay and I think alike. It's always nice to, to have that. Okay, let's see what we have. Jay's also saying to Llama Llama, continue composting in winter. It will slow down, stop, and resume breakdown when warm temperatures return. Great advice, as always, Jay. And and so th one of the things that, that, uh, that we should all be doing is making our own compost. Uh, each of my last three or four gardens, I I set up the compost pile first, and and essentially I didn't I won't say I built the garden around the compost pile, but I built the garden knowing where the compost pile was, because if you can have a compost pile close to where you're going to be putting all of your your plant waste, it makes it much easier. But just keep piling all that organic matter, and yes. Keep it going through the winter. If you live in an area like mine, or all of us that have severe winters, the pile, unless you're out there on a daily basis working on it and turning it regularly to keep the heat going, it's going to freeze. And it's so cold in my winters and I get so much snow that I don't want to go out and turn my pile when it's, it's well below freezing and windy and snowing. So I let my pile freeze in the winter. As the spring sun comes, it will thaw out the pile and that bacteria will spring to life. And because you've added material in late autumn and kept it there during the winter, then it will be ready in the spring. There will be food available for all that bacteria to jump back into action. So. You could take an active approach to try to keep your pile warm and not freeze in the winter or take the lazy gardener approach like I do, which is just allow it to sit. And then in spring, once it starts to thaw out, then you can start turning it again. Hopefully, if you turn it in early spring, you can get that heat back up, decomposed, and now it's ready for adding to your beds in spring. And then you start the whole process all over again. So. Let's see, Mage Grey Wolf is saying, I compost in the empty soil bag of bot soil. It's working great for me. Good for you. Uh, yeah, you don't have to have a big fancy compost system. You can just throw stuff in a bag and let it break down. That's definitely one thing to think about. Best way to compost when you cannot turn it. So I actually have a video I did a couple months ago that uh, talks about this uh, exactly, where you just... Keep throwing organic matter onto a pile. I call it lazy composting. And it will break down over time. It, it won't break down as quickly as if you're turning the pile. You can expect that it's going to take a year, maybe two, for a lot of material to break down. And so you can check out that video I did on lazy composting. Uh, that's one of the ways that I've been composting until this year. Because when I started this garden two years ago, I had nothing. I had no organic matter available to start a compost pile. I wanted to do it with everything that I have. And so as I got kitchen waste, I threw it in the pile. As I got grass clippings, I threw it in the pile. As I got some crushed leaves, I threw it in the pile. As I grew a few plants and then pulled them at the end of the season, I threw it in the pile. And it took about a year to give me a rough compost. It's not that, that broken down black powdery stuff, but it's compost. And, it, and I've been using it as a mulch in some of my garden beds. So that's one way to do it. You don't have to turn a pile. Turning a pile introduces oxygen and it can really make for fast compost making. When you do the slow compost method, the lazy composting, you will have more of the anaerobic bacteria if the pile gets overly wet because there's not as much oxygen because you're not turning it. But anaerobic bacteria will still break down that plant matter. It's not all aerobic bacteria. And so occasionally if you can get in there and just pry it up a little bit and introduce some oxygen, you'll encourage more aerobic bacteria. But just keep piling it, keep piling it, keep piling it. And then when you have a pile that's three feet high or so, move to another area and just let that pile break down. And it will over time and, and give you some compost. You can expect that what you're going to have to do, and I show this in the video, 
where the outer layer that's exposed to the air is not going to be broken down. It, it's going to look exactly like it did when you put it on the pile. But if you brush aside those outer layers, what's underneath is going to be great. So think about that as an option uh, for making your compost. Okay, let's see what else we have popping up. Yeah, Garden Dilemma, thank you for that. Um, beautiful garden in the background. This garden comes from River and Dale. I haven't seen Riverdale on here for uh, a little while. They pop on about once a month. And so uh, it's, it's a team of gardeners, a parent and a child. And they sent me this picture a number of months ago. And so uh, I'm just getting to it and I wanted to show it because uh, they're big supporters of the channel. And, and I, I always love it when a child is gardening. But there's some good things to see in this garden. Not only is it a beautiful garden, as you point out, with lots of plants growing, but you can see just lots of different things to do in the garden. And, and I say this all the time. You don't have to garden just one way. You can mix it up and try different things. And so right here, you see they've got the archway trellis that they're growing some plants on. All over here, there are containers. Right here, you can't see it real well, but that's a, there's actually a canoe. And so all of these plants right here are actually growing in a canoe. And the canoe is being used as a raised bed. I think that's incredibly creative and a wonderful way to use an old canoe that, that probably has holes in it and they can't use it in the water anymore. But then you see a low raised bed right here. And I really like that idea. Raised beds don't have to be tall. If you have poor soil, you can just raise up a little area like this and then work on improving the soil in that new little raised bed area and grow some great plants. And then you can see they've got wood chip mulch in the pathways all the way around the garden. Another great, great idea is to keep your pathways mulched, cuts down on the weeds. And you can see over this shoulder right here, looks like they're working in a new in-ground bed. They've got the, the tools ready to go. So they're, they're doing it a lot of different ways. Containers, trellises, raised beds, in-ground. And I, I really appreciate River and Dale sending me this photo and allowing me to, to share it with you because I think this is a great garden space. And then I'm not sure, I'm guessing back here, Maybe right there. That looks like that could be the compost pile. So near the garden, but in the back, a little bit out of the way, is a compost pile made out of some wooden pallets. And that's my compost pile uses wooden pallets. So a lot of the things that, that I do, I can see them doing in this garden. And it is a beautiful garden. So uh, I'm glad I could share it. Thank you to River and Dale for sharing it with me. And for those of you that want to share your garden, send me a photo to gardenerscott at gardenerscott.com. Give me permission to use the, the photo. Send it in full size. Don't embed it within the email. And I'll add it to the queue and add it as a background one of these days and talk about it. And it, it doesn't have to be big and green and fancy. It could be what you're doing after you just amend it. I'd love some photos like that. If you've pulled all your plants and you're in the process of amending your garden and you've got nothing but the, the bare beds with some mulch on top of it, send me photos like that. Anything that you're doing in your garden that you'd like to share with others, uh, do that. I, I, I love seeing all the photos. I learn from them. I know all of us can learn from the ideas of others and I'd love to see what you're doing. Yankee Sista, nice to see you on another Monday. Hello back at you. Had just enough mulched leaves for the gardening year, waiting to refill. Take care. That's good for you. Uh, it, it's it's reached the point. I've got. I, I need to get some some leaves this year. Uh, our our leaves have not started falling yet, but it's going to be close because I'm I'm to the point where I'm using. I think I've got two more bags of leaves left and I'll be using them as I'm getting my beds ready to go over the next couple of weeks. And then I need to stock up as well. A lot of the times when I get the dried leaves in the fall, those are the leaves I'm actually going to be using for the next year because soil amending 
soil mulching, mulching with the leaves, ends up being a season long process. And so good for you in September to be using your your mulched leaves. I think that's great because uh, we can wait till the leaves fall from the trees, bag them up and then use them all through the next season and just keep that that system going. So thank you so much for that super chat. And it's always nice to have you here on a Monday to to enjoy all this fun gardening talk. And it's so so nice to see all the stuff dropping back and forth. Jay saying to Yankee Sista, thanks for the super chat and comment about chopped leaves. I use about 500 bags for leaves, 50 chopped just last the year. There you go. So it, it's so nice. Like uh, Jay and I are obviously on the same wavelength today as to how we garden and, and the things we're doing. So thanks for that comment, Jay. It, it's so nice when when I say something and I see uh, an experienced gardener like Jay say the same thing. So it just helps show all of you that some of these ideas really work because there's a number of us that are doing the same things. Okay, let's see what else we have. Mr. Texas Bone is saying, my extra cantaloupes are worm candy for my vermicompost bins. Good for you. And I, I did the same thing. I've actually been harvesting some um, watermelons uh three different types of watermelons that actually start coming in and that's what i've been doing as well is giving some of the um the rind and some of the extra pieces to my worms in my burma compost bins as well so it is like worm candy they just plow right through melons like nothing and they seem to be very happy so good to you i'm glad your your worms are happy with all of that as well Nikki Oliver is asking any ideas on how to use dried old corn stalks in the garden. Sure. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I'm glad you asked this question because I've been trying to figure out if I'm going to do a video about corn stalks because I grew popcorn this year. And so I've got some corn stalks, two different types of popcorn. Some of them are shorter. So the stalks are about five to six feet tall, not, not tall, tall stalks. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out different uses of them that I can show in a video. And I'm not sure if that video is going to actually get made or not. But here's what I've done in the past, particularly for the bigger stocks. I think and it, it actually makes for a pretty nice visual in the garden. I, I keep them over the winter. And then in spring, I'll take three or four of the bigger corn stalks, tie them together at the top, and use them as a trellis just spread out the bottom and it becomes a self-supporting trellis for beans and so i've done that before where i've used corn stalks as a trellis for the green beans in spring and it just adds a, for me a nice little visual element if you have a chipper shredder or something you can chop up they make a great mulch because they're thick they're dense and you can put them on top of your beds as a mulch. That's another great way. You can also take them, and I did this a couple years ago, where go ahead and take your corn stalks, back area of your garden, and stack them up. And they can become a nice spot for, for birds, for insects. It's a protected area. And so I've talked about this before, where if you are encouraging wildlife in your garden, you need a protected area for the young, insects or animals. And a big stack of corn stalks could be that kind of protection for uh, the, the young birds, for the animals to hide for, uh, for, uh, away from any of the predators that you might have in your area. So, so there's an option. For the kids, it's it's fun it can be fun to use as a decoration for halloween time i remember doing that in years past where you put use corn stalks as autumn decorations in your front yard that's always an option and if you're if you're really into uh, making tamales i've done this before too you can take the corn leaves the dried leaves and rather than go to the store and buy dried corn leaves to make tamales Use your own corn or own corn leaves to make tamales. So there's a couple ideas. Those are some things that I've done with my corn stalks over the years 
And if you've got any other suggestions, any of the rest of you out there, go ahead and throw them out. Laura's saying, can compost lose its efficacy over time? Uh, yes and no. And so uh, compost is alive. You have the bacteria, you have the fungi, and it will continue to break down the organic matter until there's no more organic matter left to break down. So from that perspective, the, the texture of the compost will change over time because it will continue to be food for those microorganisms. As that happens, some of that nutrition will be released. And so nitrogen, for instance. Nitrogen will be released as a gas over time. And some of those other nutrients in the compost will dissipate over time because they'll be released as a gas into the air. So you can still use it fully composted organic matter, still has nutrients, still has benefits to improve soil structure. And so don't think that, oh, it's too old, I shouldn't use it, don't throw it away. You can always use it to improve the structure of your soil, but yes, it might have fewer nutrients over time and the texture will change over time. It, it comes down to at what point you want to use it. Like I talked about with the, the slow composting or the lazy composting method, that compost tends to be pretty rough, big pieces, chunky pieces. That's what I'll throw on as a mulch on top of the soil. The compost that is more decomposed that's the stuff I'll work into the soil. And so old compost uh, can still be worked into the soil and still give benefits. And uh, a lot of it has to do with how much time you have when you get around to it and don't worry too much about it. It's better to put old compost in your soil than no compost at all. That's kind of the way I, I look for it. Alec is saying, I use corn stalks as supports for climbing plants for a season then they break down in the second season. There you go, great idea. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be beans. I, I do it with beans just because I think beans and corn stalks look great together. But yeah, any climbing plant can definitely be used. So good idea for that. Okay, let's see. Texas Bone is saying, I found a big pile of leaves. I'm gonna fill up the truck today. It's cool to be here. Others getting leaves. Yeah, good for you. And uh, I'm not sure if he's on today. Uh, but yeah, last year um, I went down to Pueblo uh, at the end of the season and collected a ton of leaves. And, and maybe I'll repeat that this year and get, get a whole bunch of leaves because uh, once they fall, a lot of cities will, will co collect them and too many homeowners will rake them up and put them into bags and put them on the curb. And then the city will come and grab those bags and throw them into a landfill and it's such a waste. So if you see your neighbors doing that, I've done this many, many times. Go up to your neighbor's house and ask if you can have their leaves and use them in your garden. I've, my neighbors do that. My neighbors know that they just throw the bags over the fence and I'm going to use them. That they, they don't need to have them trucked away by the city to go into a landfill. They're going to find a good use in my garden. So work with your neighbors. If you don't have trees or you don't think you have enough leaves, Get them from others. Collect them however you want. And if you find a big pile, by all means, take your truck and pick it up and go ahead and do all you can. And Natasha's saying, be sure to leave some leaves for overwintering beneficial insects. There you go. And this is the same basic idea as stacking up the, the corn stalks. Absolutely. I, I have piles of leaves back where I've got piles of twigs and piles of corn stalks and everything else for those overwintering insects as well. So I agree with you. There's lots of beneficial insects that need a place to overwinter and it needs to be hidden and protected and leaves are often the thing to do. Okay, let's see what we have. Jay saying leaf collectors, make sure that they are dry, easy to chop when dry with a mower or a mulcher. Absolutely. The um, And they'll break down quicker too. So that's why I say crushed leaves that I use as a mulch because I like my mulches to be decomposing and, and, and improve the soil while they're acting as a mulch. And a crushed 
dried leaf will break down faster than a whole leaf and uh, run through the the, uh, the lawnmower. Absolutely, that's a great way to to get them to break down and be ready to, to use. Emmy Miller says, I was thinking of burying some frozen bananas on one side. How long would it take for them to migrate? And so let's see what Jay was talking about for migration. If you're talking about worms to migrate, uh, it won't take long at all. Worms actually cover an awful lot of distance and they can find things like buried bananas. Um, if you're talking about bacteria, it may take a little bit longer. I see some discussion talking about um, the worms. There you go. Jay Dixon's talking about worms. And so worms will find your, your organic matter buried in the soil in a surprisingly short period of time, if you've got worms. Now, I don't have a lot of worms. I've actually, <clears throat> I've got a ton of worms in my front yard now because I've really worked on amending that soil and having a lot of mulch. And so in my back beds, I don't have as many worms yet. So when I'm putting plants in or working in the front and I come across some worms, I'll actually move the worms to the back. Rather than waiting for them to migrate 100 feet, I'll just shorten the process and actually put the worms into to my beds directly. And so I'm seeing some increased population in my new raised beds because I do that. But even without that, I saw this at the Galileo School Garden. The entire space had been basketball courts. So they were surrounded by a concrete barrier that was the foundation for the asphalt that was poured for the, 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 um, the courts. Then underneath that was crushed granite and rock. It was dense, it was com compacted, it was terrible, terrible soil, which is one reason why we put primarily raised beds in. But in one big area, I brought in heavy equipment, we dug down deep, we filled the whole space with plants and leaves and everything organic we could find. And within two years, that space was teeming with earthworms. So the earthworms not only dug underneath all that concrete and burrowed through all of that, that compacted, dense rock and material, they found the organic matter and then just exploded. So it may take some time, but uh, especially in an area where you know you already have some worms, they're going to find the buried material, especially something nice and juicy like bananas. They'll find it in no time whatsoever. Okay. Uh, and so Alex wondering, what's the view of adding bot worms to garden soil? So I'm not a huge fan of adding purchased worms for a few reasons. So a, a lot of the, the worms that you buy for fishing are similar or may be the red wigglers that we use in our vermicomposting. So my worm bins that I have in my basement are using red wiggler worms and they'll eat kitchen waste. Now the nice thing about red wigglers is they live in the top three or four inches of soil. And so that's why they work so great in a home setting where you can throw in all your kitchen scraps and your melons and the worms will eat that material because they live at the surface and they can just digest that material and create all the worm, wonderful worm castings for you. That's typically what you're going to buy. If you're going to buy a, a different type of worm, for instance, a night crawler, you can buy night crawlers. Well, night crawlers burrow many feet into the soil. And so if you add a purchased worm, a couple different things are possible. One, depending on your climate, your winters, they're not going to survive. Red wigglers, because they're only living in the top few inches of soil, if you get cold winters where that top few inches freezes, then all those worms are going to be killed. It's, it's just that simple. That's why we use them in indoor settings because they can only survive in a very small range of warm temperatures. And it's too cold in our garden for some of these purchased worms 
to survive the winter. Now, if you want to treat them like an annual plant where you know you're going to start the plant in spring and it's going to die in fall, and you want to do the same thing with worms where you buy worms, put them in the garden in the spring, and you know they're going to die in the fall, sure, go for it. And they'll, they'll actually do some good. They'll break down that organic matter and they'll leave their castings in the soil. Absolutely, that could be a good thing to do. Some of those other burrowing, deep burrowing worms like the night crawlers, they're all over the place. And so if you put them into a garden bed with the intent that they're going to benefit that bed, they're probably going to migrate someplace else because they just burrow deep. That's what they do. And especially in the winter, they'll survive because they'll burrow deep and curl into a little ball to survive the cold temperatures. But they may migrate to your neighbor's yard. It's a lot like the, the ladybugs. If you buy ladybugs and you release them and they fly away to your neighbor's yards, sometimes those purchased worms can do the same thing if they're those deep burrowing worms. So I'm not a big fan, like I, like I was talking about with the Galileo Garden. If you build it, they will come. If you create an inviting space with lots of organic matter, the worms will come, they'll find it, they'll, they'll populate and expand their population, and you'll have happy soil, and they'll be doing all their benefits. If you can find a worm producer in your area, so you're putting in a native worm that is known to survive the winters and improve the soil, that is a good way to approach buying a worm. But to buy it on the internet and hope that it's going to improve your garden, I think it's a roll of the dice and there's really no guarantee that they actually will improve the, the situation in your area. Okay, Mariah is asking, do I still have worm bins? Do you add worms to your raised bed? So uh, I do have my worm bins and other than, like I just talked about, where I take the worms from the front yard and move them to the backyard, I do not use the worms from my worm bins in my raised beds for all the reasons I just talked about. Now, <clears throat> that being said, because I use worm castings, my own worm castings, in my potting soil that I make, and then I use that potting soil for my own seedlings, and then I transplant the seedlings into my garden, well, often, every year, when I make that potting soil with my worm castings, there will be some worm eggs, some of those little capsules. And those worms will hatch in the pots while the seedlings are growing. And every year when I'm transplanting my tomatoes or my peppers or whatever it was I was growing inside, it's not unusual for me to find worms in that little pot that I was growing tomatoes in. So now I put that pot into my garden and those worms are now in my raised bed. So I don't plan it that way, it just happens. But I also know that those worms aren't gonna survive my winters. And so they can do what they do during the summer to help benefit the soil, but it's not anything that I'm doing on purpose. It just kinda happens. Okay, Hot Pepper Paul, good to see you here. Some of my raised beds are three feet deep and they are full of earthworms, absolutely. And that's, I, I'm often asked, because uh, I have a lot of videos about raised beds and building raised beds, and I'm often asked about putting a barrier underneath the bed. And a lot of people think you need to put plastic underneath the bed to keep weeds from growing up through it. Well, first off, especially if you've got beds that are three feet deep, it's gonna be smothering and killing any, any grass or weeds that were underneath it when you put that bed in place. But if you put plastic or plywood or any kind of barrier underneath your raised beds, then you are keeping the earthworms from finding your bed. So I'm a huge advocate of leaving the bottom of beds open because the worms will find it. And sure, if it's a three foot bed, they're going to be migrating, exploring, moving through the soil. They'll discover your bed, they'll burrow up through it, and now it'll be filled with worms. And so, yes, absolutely. Some of those beds where I have worms now are beds that I didn't bring worms from the front yard to, and they've got worms in them because I'll have a, a worm from a two foot high bed that burrows down, migrates, burrows up to another bed nearby that's two feet tall, or in this case with Paul, three feet tall, 
and they just explode in your garden area. So great way to approach getting that worm population growing. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, yeah, Silly Lily saying worm castings are produced by red wrigglers, not your earthworms. You place them in large bins, add waste. Once you have castings, use a sifter to sift castings and build the frame. Uh, yeah, and I have a video where I show a couple different methods of how I collect my castings. The the castings that we are collecting are definitely from the red wigglers. So Lily's exactly right. The earthworms that like the um, the night crawlers do have a different process. They're just like tunnel machines where they're digging through, they're eating the material, they're excreting it with a lot of their own beneficial gut bacteria into the soil. So it's not how we think of as castings as uh, an extra product. It's like worm manure that they're spreading through the soil. Just like if you have a horse in a pasture, they're spreading their manure all over the pasture. A lot of the earthworms, that's what they're doing. They're spreading their manure all through the soil as opposed to any way that we're actually collecting the casting. So um, good good point to point out the difference. Mr. Grimm is saying, using the paper leaf bags as a bottom layer in a raised bed, thick enough to block weeds, break down, and nice worm food. Yeah, and cardboard the same way. If you do have a, a bad weed problem and, and shallow bed, so you want to smother and kill those weeds, cardboard can be great too. And a lot of the glues that are used in cardboard are actually one of those foods that, that worms really like. So when that cardboard gets wet, the worms are going to be there and they'll definitely chow down on that cardboard over time and it will have killed the weeds. And so uh, you can do the same thing with uh, either the paper bags or a cardboard or newspaper. A few different layers of, of newspaper underneath your beds the same way. But yes, good point. You need to have a material that can break down over time and that will benefit the worms getting into your bed. Alex asking, remember you built a Hugo culture bed? Is it being successful? Absolutely. And so I, I've been using last year and this year, my Hugo culture bed is where I have squashes and pumpkins growing. Last year was, was hugely successful. If you go back and watch my video on how to hand pollinate pumpkins, all of those plants were growing in that Hugo culture bed, and you can see how great those plants look. I, I didn't have a specific video on it this year, but you can see it in the background on some of my videos uh, where my pumpkin plants and zucchini plants are growing in the Hugo culture bed. So yeah, it's great. I love it. it it's, it's all of the benefits to Hugo culture are there. I noticed that, I, that the, the soil stays moist longer in that bed because it has all that buried organic matter, all those logs and branches. And so my raised beds, and this is an, an issue with raised beds, they do tend to dry out faster. My, dry, my raised beds do dry out faster than my Hugo culture bed. But I knew that going into it and I can see it in practice, but yeah, Hugo culture is a great way to go and it has been very successful. I'm thinking about doing another one in a different area of my garden. Uh, just because I like it so much. So thanks for asking. That's definitely something to um, to consider. And if you're not sure about the Hugo culture, check out my Hugo culture video and you can show how I built that bed. Susan's asking about hardware cloth. Does it help with voles? Absolutely. And so all of my beds, if you look closely on the on the videos where I'm making the beds and filling the beds, you can see that I have chicken wire, and or hardware cloth underneath all of my raised beds because I've got gophers and voles. Now voles typically are burrowing closer to the surface. And so for my deeper beds, I just use the chicken wire for gopher deterrence. For my shallower beds, I'm using hardware cloth because the voles might burrow into those shallow beds. But yeah, absolutely. Hardware cloth uh, is, is a great deterrent for voles. And it's something, if you've got that problem, I would suggest doing. I, I have not seen any indication of voles or gophers in my raised beds, but I see signs of them all the time in open areas of my garden. So uh, something to think about when you're 
you're constructing your garden and your beds. Uh, and I do the same thing. Actually, I don't do it on purpose, but I've talked about the cat in my area before, and I have a cat that patrols the neighborhood, and I know that cat has taken care of not only the gophers, but the voles. So if you've got a cat or if you've got a wandering cat, encourage it because that is a great way to, to deal with the voles as well. So uh, let's see. Um, what else do we have? I want to... Yeah, Jay is saying I use elements of Hugo culture in my raised beds, and and I do that too. The the uh, video I did this year where I filled up my metal beds, I I put logs and branches and leaves in the bottom half of the beds, and so Hugo culture doesn't have to be dedicated. Now the 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 Hugo culture mound bed that I have that I'm growing the squashes and the pumpkins in. That's nothing but Hugo culture, and it was designed with that thought in mind, just a mounded area that's covering all those buried logs. But yeah, Jay, I do the same thing. In all of my raised beds, I'm burying the branches and the logs and the twigs so that they can break down and give me the elements of Hugo culture to improve the soil. And because they're low, you know, this doesn't gets back to the earthworm migration and why a three foot tall bed might have earthworms in them because as those worms are migrating all that decomposing wood at the bottom of the beds the worms are going to find it and they're going to feed on on that that decomposing organic material and then once they're in the bed and they burrow up to the top now they're going to be exposed to your typical garden soil that you're putting your plants into that's how a bed gets populated is the if the worms are burrowing and they start discovering your bed and there's no organic matter at the base of your bed, well, they might just keep on going. There's no reason for them to stay in that bed because they don't have the food. They're going to keep looking for food. Put organic matter in the bottom of your bed. Hugo culture is a great way to do it. And you're likely to have earthworms find your, your beds as opposed to not. So, okay, let's see. Yeah, Hillary is saying, we used cardboard to establish new mulched flower beds too. And um, I wanted to do that video this year. It didn't get done. Maybe it'll end up being a fall video. But, but that's exactly what I've been doing in my front is using cardboard over grass and weeds and then adding soil and mulch to create new flower beds. So great idea. Cardboard can have a lot of benefits in the garden. Glad you've discovered that. <clears throat> And so talking about discovery, I uh, wanted to bring up this subject for you. So I just did a video this last week about uh, tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. I did a taste test of five different cherry tomatoes. And I was surprised that the one that I chose in that taste testing, along with the one that was the favorite of my family, was the sun sugar cherry tomato. For years and years and years, the sweet 100 has been my favorite and I still love it. I, I still love it. But when I had to make a decision, I chose the sun sugar as a new favorite tomato. Now next year, I will continue to grow sweet 100 and I will continue to grow sun sugar. But it really got me thinking about how too often we have our favorites that we grow in our garden. And so we grow those favorite plants because we know we like it. And it's easy to just get lackadaisical and keep growing the plants that we know we like because they're our favorites. But occasionally when you try something new, you discover a new favorite. And so sun sugar for me is a new favorite. Next year, I'm going to be trying a whole bunch of new varieties of cherry tomatoes. Some of you commented on that video saying, have you tried the chocolate cherry or have you tried this or have you tried that? Some of those I have tried, some of them I haven't. Next year, I'm going to be trying a lot of those new varieties to see if I can find a new favorite. So imagine if you would, if your garden was nothing but sweet 100 cherry tomatoes, you would probably be happy. You'd be eating sweet 100 cherry tomatoes every single day. But when you add something to the mix like sun sugar, now 
You can have both the Sweet 100 and the Sun Sugar every single day, and they're both fantastic. And next year, I hope to discover a new favorite, another plant in the cherry tomato that we're talking about that I'll continue to grow year after year. And so while this year I grew about a dozen different varieties of tomatoes, some did well, some did better, some didn't do as well, some I'll repeat, some I won't, that's all part of gardening. But when you can find something that becomes a favorite, now it's even better. And if you can have multiple favorites, oh man, that's the best of all worlds. And so it's not just the cherry tomatoes, it's radishes, it's carrots, it's squash, it's all of the other plants in your garden. If you're growing something because it does well or because you like it, keep doing it. But when you discover a plant that is clearly a favorite, you like the taste, you like how it grows, it does well, it's easy, all of those factors, definitely keep growing it, but don't stop there. Use that as a jumping off point, as a diving board into new gardening opportunities. So that some point, when you get to be that old gardener and your garden has reached a point where you're slowing down a little bit, you've got a long list of plants all of your favorites that you've developed over time. And so now your garden in your golden years can become a space that requires little effort and maximum enjoyment because you've spent all your time winnowing out those things that didn't work so well and then focusing on those things that do work well. And so even though I really was shocked and a little disappointed that the Sweet 100 wasn't my favorite tomato this year, I'm actually quite happy that I discovered the Sun Sugar because it's my grandkids' favorite. It's the one that, that I, all my neighbors love. I shared a whole bunch of tomatoes this year. It's just one of those things that brought a lot of happiness to a lot of people. And if I hadn't have tried Sun Sugar, if I had stopped with Sweet 100, it'd still be okay but I would have missed out on a lot of those new experiences and that happiness that I was able to share with others because they discovered a new favorite with the Sun Sugar Cherry Tomato. And Sun Gold is close behind as a favorite. So you can expect for the rest of my gardening career, I'll probably be growing Sweet 100, Sun Gold, and Sun Sugar every year and just keep adding to the list to find those favorites until the time comes. And if I can only grow five cherry tomatoes, what would those five cherry tomatoes be? Well, over time, I'll have figured out what my five favorites are. If I stopped with one, I would not have a list of the top five. And so that's what I wanna encourage you to, you to do today is aim for a top five in everything your top five beans, your top five tomatoes, your top five lettuces, your top five of everything you're growing in the garden. And you may not be able to find five of a particular type of plant, but even potatoes, I'm growing five different kinds of potatoes this year with the goal of figuring out which ones I like best and which ones I'll repeat. If I find a favorite potato, okay, now that goes on the list, I'll continue to grow that. And then next year, I'll try three or four new varieties of potatoes until I can get to that point that I have it figured out for me in my garden, which ones work best, which ones are my favorites, and which ones I'll carry forward to the future. And of course, which ones I'll share with all of you and encourage that you consider growing in your gardens like the sun sugar and i discovered sun sugar because one of you actually a bunch of you suggested that i try sun sugar a few years ago i did i love it and i would have never tried it if i didn't want to try something new and discover that newness and wonderfulness of a favorite that you didn't even know was out there so expand your gardening world if your season is coming to an end and you're starting to think about what you're going to grow next year start making the list of all those new things and if you're in the spring and you're just getting ready to start your season well 
what haven't you purchased? What haven't you saved? What haven't you decided to put into your garden for this year that you still have time to do? And you might discover something that just really makes the season a total, total success from the enjoyment aspect. Because as you know, I'm all about the enjoyment and it's one of those things that I think we should strive for. So coming to the end of our time, I thank you so much for all that you're doing. I'll just give a, a, a quick shout out to uh, the channel members. If you've joined the Gardener Scott channel as a member and you're at the garden training or garden collaborator level, we're going to continue this conversation in a separate live stream coming up here in just a little bit. And that's one of the perks of being a member of the Gardener Scott channel is that I do extra live streams for channel members. So if you hadn't seen that message and you're a training or collaborator member, stick around. I'll be back in about 15 minutes and we'll do another live stream for everybody. I'll be back next Monday to talk about how the gardening week went, what's next in the garden, and of course, answer questions and throw out all the information that I can, along with all the information from all of you, since you're so helpful and so knowledgeable and encouraging to the global gardeners everywhere. Thanks for being here. See you next week. I'm Gardener Scott. Enjoy gardening.